Welcome back to the Immaculata Church Project here in St. Mary's, Kansas. Today we're going to give you a construction update video and Father Rutledge is going to talk about the main altar. So progress on the exterior, we've gotten some of the retaining walls on the north side in the hardscapes. We, we did get some more sidewalk and stairways in. They will be clearing that north lot uh, over the next weeks and we'll start seeing some curb and gutter and that parking lot will be paved. Uh, the roofers are almost complete. Uh, you can see they're working on the, the gutters and downspouts. Um, we do have the bells installed. All five bells are installed and operable. As you can see, there's a building here to my left. Uh, that building contains four statues. It contains the large statue of Our Lady that's going on the cupola, Christ the King in the front facade, and then St. Cyril of Alexandria on the north transept, and then St. Louis de Montfort on the south. In a few more days, on November 3rd or 4th, depending on the winds, uh, those statues will be uh, installed with a crane. Now let's go inside and we'll look at the progress in there. Morning, guys. So on the interior, we did get a lot of stone installed. Uh, here I'm standing next to some of the uh, chancel pier stone. Most of the pilasters here behind me and across the way, you can see those are on. Uh, capitals are installed. We, all the narthex um, columns are in. Um, we have gotten all of the artwork on the ceiling is complete. It's been inspected and they're taking the scaffolding down. So as this scaffolding system comes down in the crossing and transepts, and once that, those materials are cleared, that'll make way for our stone installation guys to come and start flooring that and then do the stone flooring in the sanctuary here. Now we're gonna turn it over to Father Rutledge and he's gonna talk about the main altar. So we've spoken about, in our last number of videos, we've spoken about a lot of the other aspects of the church, the artwork, and many other individual elements. Today we're going to look at the most important part of the church, which is the main altar. I want to talk about its significance, its preciousness, and some of the thoughts that went into the design. I do ask you to watch this entire video, especially if you plan on making any comments, because I think that there's nothing more misunderstood than what the church requires of an altar and maybe even what an altar actually is. We spoke about some of these things in our April update video last year, but at that time we hadn't gone into too much detail of the design of the altar. So we'll be able to explain a little bit of that to you as well. The Immaculata's main altar is a freestanding altar, which means that it's detached from the back wall of the sanctuary. Since the Immaculata was designed taking a lot of inspiration from Roman basilicas, where freestanding altars are the tradition and fit the architecture, our sanctuary too was designed with such an altar. We love this Roman feature of the Immaculata because it links us with architectural tradition and it allows for the performance of the liturgy in its perfection in even less essential details. The freestanding altar was the norm for Catholic churches until about the eighth century when other elements of altar design came in. And we saw at that time some more vertical elements being attached to the back of the altar, which we call nowadays gradines and reredos. Gradines are basically the shelves attached to the back of the altar on which the candlesticks, relics, and flowers often go. And the reredos are the vertical kind of walls or screens attached to the back of the altar, which often have sculpture or other architectural features. Reredos are used often when a sanctuary is smaller and the altar is pushed back against the wall. And the goal of using them is to give a prominence to the altar, but within a limited space. This style is extremely common. I mean, for example, there was an altar that I installed in Pittsburgh that had reredos due to a much smaller sanctuary or even the Society's Church in Denver has very ornate reredos that are very beautiful in all of marble. You can see here I even have a book from the 1920s. It's basically a catalog of altars that people could select for their churches with different reredos and such. They're all very beautiful and all these styles are accepted by the church. 
There may be some liturgical preferences for our freestanding altar, but that, that isn't a question of one of any of these styles being bad or forbidden. So before we talk more about the preciousness of our freestanding altar, let's first understand what an altar is. So what is an altar? There are three elements to an altar, the mensa, the stipes, and the sepulcher. That's to say the mensa is the top, the top flat part of the altar. The stipes are the supports, which are sometimes walls or sometimes columns. And then there's the sepulcher, which is the cavity on the top of the altar, which receives two relics and three grains of incense. That's what an altar is and nothing more. You might say then, well, Father's saying that an altar is a table. Well, structurally speaking, yes, it is. And it's always traditionally been so. But of course, we know that it becomes much more than a table by its consecration. It isn't just a table where a meal takes place, as is so often emphasized today in modern Catholic churches and where the priest faces the people. Rather, it's an altar made of stone showing its permanence on which the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ is daily offered. It's a place of real immolation. And that's why we place the relics of martyrs in the altar and also why we insist on having three altar cloths on the altar as is traditionally done. They point to the sacrificial nature of the, of the Mass. And that's why in our consecration ceremony of the church, the, probably the center point of that consecration is the consecration of the altar. To further show this permanence of our main altar made of stone, we even have poured a concrete column substructure under the altar that goes all the way through the basement to the church's foundation. So to me, the beauty of a freestanding altar is that it emphasizes the altar itself. It's like a holy mountain in the middle of the sanctuary, like Moriah, where Isaac was almost immolated, or more properly speaking, like Calvary, where our Lord was immolated, where the sacrifice is offered. So our altar is seven steps above the main level of the nave, and so it's quite elevated from where the faithful sit, and they'll be able to see this holy mountain, if you will. The verticality and focality, shall we say, making the altar the focal point, it was achieved in a different way than using reredos. And here I kind of want to take you on a little progression, visual progression, so that you can kind of see that our altar and sanctuary has immense vertical and visual elements that emphasize the altar. So back behind our altar, we have a very large colonnade of green marble columns. These are the only green marble columns going in the church. All the other 50 columns and pilasters in the church have been clad in a limestone so that it makes these columns in the sanctuary uh, stick out emphatically. They will also tie into the floor design and colors so that one's sight from even the back of the church will naturally be drawn up to the sanctuary. Also, we have so much artwork, as we explained even in our September video, going into the five bays of the ambulatory back behind the altar. This central bay with the Paschal Lamb will have gold leafing all around the Lamb to make it stand out beyond the simple metallic gold paint going everywhere else in the church. So we could have had reredos. We could have had a baldachin with four columns around the altar. We have something even more impressive with an eight column colonnade with artwork spanning the entire back of the sanctuary with up to 30 vertical feet of artwork. But don't you have to have a baldachin over a main altar. No, not necessarily. Even the Congregation of Rites recognized that this requirement, even in Rome, had fallen into disuse, especially if the architecture already shows good taste. So the next section, I want to talk a little bit about the preciousness of the stone going into our altar. We have four very beautiful types of stone going into the altar, two of which are extremely rare and precious. We do have a white marble that's called Valachis and it is quarried from the mountainsides of Falacro in Greece. This all white marble has gray and brown veining and for that reason, it's often called the Carrera of Greece. There's also a gold marble going into the altar, which comes from Turkey and adds to the sense that the altar is a place of divinity where God's glory is promoted and where God even dwells in the tabernacle. And then there are two different types of blue stone that are being incorporated into the altar not only as a way to bring a Marian theme to the main altar, but also because these stones are so precious. The lighter blue is called ocean blue. It comes from Brazil. It's a quartzite, has a very smooth and lustrous appearance, and is very strong. The other darker blue is a granite that also comes from Brazil. It's called lapis lazuli. 
Blue is the rarest color of stone in the entire world. It's the most expensive stone as well, which is what, why these blue stones cost easily more than 10 times the amount of any other stone going into the Immaculata. So this blue has historically been called more precious than gold. So by incorporating that blue stone into a relatively simple altar design, we're truly making the main altar the most precious object in the church, as we should rightly do, and through using a stone that is both visually stunning and extremely rare. And because this blue was often used even in the Renaissance period to depict Our Lady's garment, it being a heavenly color, I kind of like to think too of the use of this blue as sort of Our Lady enshrining our Lord, uh, sort of like the Pieta, where our Lord in his sacrifice is clothed in her garment. That's just a personal take on it, but it's, I think, a little bit of, of how we can see this main altar. So I said earlier, we do have a very large altar, altar being what it is. Our altar is 11 foot four long and is five feet deep. This is a size proportionate to the size of our church and our sanctuary. And it's certainly big enough to accommodate the large number of ciboria that will be consecrated on it daily. Um, our tabernacle is also very large and will be encased in marble, with the, but with a bronze circular interior. And it will fit up to six ciboria for our very largest masses here, where we'll have six priests distributing communion. And at the center of the altar front, or shall we say in the center of the altar's supports, or stipes, as I mentioned earlier, in the central medallion, there will be a carved relief of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which we will gold leaf, and this too will add to the overall preciousness of the main altar uh, and pointing to the, one of the church's themes in her Immaculate Heart. On our altar mensa too, because of its size and depth, we will have 10 candlesticks along with plenty of other space for relics and flowers. So as you can see, we have an altar that is being made with the most precious materials possible, the most precious materials in the entire church that will symbolize Our Lady and her Immaculate Heart. We have an altar on which all of the liturgical functions can happen. And we have a place that expresses permanence on which the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ can be daily offered.